Hello, everyone. Welcome, and thank you for tuning in to another art lecture brought to you by Cleveland Heights Library. Today, we'll be looking at the work of Wilhelm Hammerschoy. He's probably unfamiliar to most of you, but his work has been getting more attention in the last couple decades, and he's one of my personal favorite artists. Hammerschoy was a Danish painter active in the late 19th, early 20th century. He specialized in interior scenes of his apartment in Copenhagen, but instead of warm, cozy domestic vignettes, he shows us almost totally empty spaces that seem almost colorless, just shades of gray, beige, blue, violet. This is not a homey feeling home, and there's a sense of mystery, strangeness, and almost heaviness or unreality in his work. Now, this talk is a little different from the ones that I've done in the past, because this is the result of my own original research into Hammershoi. I'll introduce you to the artist with a brief biography, and then I'd like to share with you my interpretation of his work, uh, an interpretation that takes this uncanny quality, this sense of strangeness or a slight discomfort, and looks at what exactly this feeling is, how Hammershoi creates it, and what it does. So we'll be looking closely at his paintings to understand how they work in a sense, how they feel, um, how they make us feel what we feel. Uh, Wilhelm Hammerschoy was born in Copenhagen in 1864 and was active until just before his death in 1916. He began studying art at just eight years old and was trained at the Danish Royal Academy of Fine Arts, which was the major art school for Northern Europe. At age 21, Hammershoi achieved instant fame at the Academy's spring exhibition with this portrait of his sister Anna. And when another painting at the exhibition won the award, 41 artists petitioned that it be given the prize. Their petition was rejected, and this was one of the main events that spurred the formation of the independent anti-academic exhibition Den Freie Utsdig. It's um, in some ways similar to the Impressionist movement, which they're both rejections of the uh, official academic uh, art system. And from the beginning of his artistic career, as you can see, Hammershoi favored muted palettes, simple, quiet compositions and personal subjects like domestic interiors set in his own home and portraits of family members. His sister, Anna, was his most frequent model until he married Ida Ilsted, whose brother was also a painter and whom we see here in this double portrait uh, that Hammershoi did shortly after they were married. As his career progressed, Hammershoi's uh, work was exhibited internationally uh, and internationally praised. The famous poet Rainer Marie Rilke was one of many who praised his art for its quiet power. Four of his paintings were chosen to represent Denmark at the 1889 Exposition Universelle in Paris, including this painting, A Young Girl Sewing, which is another portrait of his sister, uh, and which won a bronze medal at the exposition. Hammershoi and Ida traveled multiple times to Germany, the Netherlands, London, and Paris. And interestingly, he enjoyed greater popularity in the international community than within his own country during his lifetime. In spite of this, the Hammershoys always returned happily to their Copenhagen apartment, which you see here uh, in this photograph um, from today. The building is still standing. And his work really demonstrated uh, rarely demonstrated any influence from his contact with other styles. He very much admired uh, other painters, his contemporaries, but he had a clear artist artistic vision that was not altered by externals. That's not to say that there aren't similarities, however, between Hamashoi's work and that of other artists. There absolutely are. Early on, while he was still a student, Hamashoi experimented with the style of James McNeil Whistler, uh, who he greatly admired. This is one of Whistler's most iconic works on the right. You've probably seen it or parodies of it before. And on the left, you can see Hammershoi emulating it by adopting the same subject matter, the same pose, composition, and similar colors. The two artists uh, even tried to meet in London years later, but it didn't work out, which is really too bad. Uh, during Hammershoi's time, viewers and critics also pointed out connections between his work and 16th and 17th century Dutch paintings, especially Vermeer, whose work had sort of been rediscovered in the 1870s and so was very popular and current in the um, cultural imagination. 
And since then, Hamashoi's interiors have also been compared, uh, and I think correctly, to Edward Hopper for their constructions of charged, melancholic, and strangely portentous spaces. And these comparisons all make sense. But the fact remains that Hamashoi's work is entirely different from any of them. As a student, Hamashoi learned to adapt Whistler's coordination of color and the construction of clean compositions. Whistler was interested in arranging visually harmonious images in the same way that a composer arranges sounds. In fact, he titled his paintings things like Nocturne in Black and Gold, or this one, Harmony in Flesh, Color, and Red, musical terms. But Whistler was also attracted to decorative elements and patterns that were often inspired by Japanese art. He wanted his compositions to be visually pleasing. They were art for art's sake. He was a leader of the aesthetic movement. And it was common for 16th and 17th century Dutch painters like Samuel van Hoogstraten to create trompe l'oeil domestic scenes, that is, views that used linear perspective to give the sense of distance and space to make the painted scene look like it's a continuation of the viewer's space. These scenes are often filled with little knickknacks and still lifes and general domestic clutter to enliven it even further. And it also was an opportunity uh, for the artist to show off their skill. In sharp contrast to this, Hammershoi's interiors are devoid of the comfortable, affluent, and homelike character of these Dutch paintings. And as for Vermeer, both artists treat light as its own subject and specialize in middle-class domestic scenes of the everyday. But Vermeer's gently bright interiors are always populated by at least one, but often two or more figures. There is a sense of quiet warmth and peace and comfort. Whereas when Hamashoi inserts a figure into his cold spaces, her back is almost invariably turned and seems almost frozen in inactivity and tension. What I find especially interesting is the way that scholars seem to be uncomfortable with the strangeness that underlies all of Hammershoi's work. Ever since he began exhibiting, people have been trying to come up with ways to explain away the unnerving atmosphere of his paintings. And many of the scholars and curators who have approached Hammershoi's work try to normalize it, to make it seem less strange. They'll use the paintings to psychoanalyze Hammershoi and to construct theories about his familial relationships with his wife and his mother and his sister. In the 1980s, one writer even argued that the artist must have been colorblind because surely no one else could have painted such washed out scenes. And one of Hammershoi's contemporaries uh, said that the painter was suffering from something called neurasthenia, which was a sort of pseudoscientific condition, a mental breakdown in which the nervous system was believed to be so overwhelmed by the many stimuli of contemporary modern life that it just shuts off entirely. Now, the other common approach to Hammershoi's work is to catalog and cross-reference the items and spaces in the paintings, mapping them onto the layout of the apartment. And this is kind of a fun scavenger hunt, but it doesn't really contribute to our understanding or enhance our experience of these works. Ultimately, all of these, temp these attempts to place Hammershoi within an artistic tradition to locate sources of influence, to catalog and record, to analyze and deconstruct, they all seek to make Hammershoi somehow manageable, reasonable, and normal. None of them are able to fully address the strange impact of these paintings upon the viewer beyond simply calling them strange or desolate and so forth. Some scholars don't even make it an attempt. But all of these scholars want to somehow get around the strangeness of Hammershoi's spaces, and I think that this is a mistake. To minimize or skirt around the phenomenological impact, that is, the felt experience of these paintings, is really to look only at their shell. It's like trying to understand a nightingale without ever listening to its song. So what happens if we treat this vague discomfort as something to be appreciated and explored instead of explained away and ignored? This quality is what makes Hammershoi's paintings so intriguing, so hauntingly beautiful. There's something mysterious and fascinating and poignant about Hammershoi's work, and I don't think that we should downplay that. 
Although we may not be able to fully explain the subjective impact of Hamashrei's works on the viewer, we can tease out the ways in which his works are constructed to challenge the viewer's attempts to process and therefore to domesticate these domestic spaces. So today I'll suggest my own interpretation of his paintings. Uh, it may certainly be shared with other curators and academics, but it's something that I came to independently through my research. And to do this, we'll look closely at one painting in particular, entitled Four Rooms, to see how Hamashoi constructed the scene in a way that causes the viewer to experience an uncanny feeling of existential homesickness. So let's begin. This is an oil painting on canvas and it's just under three feet tall and just over two feet across. So it, it's not a small painting. And when it's hung at the standard display height of 58 inches from the center, the viewer's eye level is at the appropriate height for the painting's internal perspective. So that means that our point of view standing in front of the painting corresponds with the view of someone standing within the painted room as if the painted room is just an extension of our space. We're presented here with a barely furnished uh, domestic space that is dimly lit by sunlight like filtering through a window blocked by drawn curtains. Through the open door before us, we see three other rooms beyond, all through open doorways. An empty chair and a barely legible sofa are the only furniture in these rooms, and the room in which we are standing has only three objects, a table, a bowl, and a mirror. We will come back to the mirror in a minute. You'll notice that our view is off center, so that looking directly down through the series of open doors, we see them from a slight angle instead of straight on. It's like we just happen to come in from the side to see everything flung open in this way. There's something odd about the view through the doors. See, the four rooms alternate light, dark, light, dark, and light. The second and middle door um, opens away from us so that we can only see its slim profile. It's easy to miss. And so what happens is that this open doorway becomes strangely mirror-like as both of the, the first and the last doors are visible to us. And the middle door bisects the rooms in two sets of two. So it's the halfway point, in other words. And this symmetry is just enough to give the mind's eye pause, demanding clarification. We do know that these are in fact real rooms and not a reflection because we can see that the second door and uh, because we can see that second door, excuse me, and because the angles of the other two doors are not identical. But we have to really look carefully in order to actually figure that out. Hamarjoy has done everything he can to subtly confuse us. And this is a work that was done at the end of his career. So he's really pulling out all of his skills here. A good example of this that comes from the mirror. We can't see our reflection in the mirror, but where we're standing wouldn't be visible in the mirror anyway. So the fact that that reflection doesn't show us anything neither confirms nor denies our presence, and it gives us no clue as to the spatial arrangement. And in fact, the spatial and architectural logic of these rooms is not only unclear, it's actively inconsistent. But these inconsistencies are in small details that our eye and mind take in without us consciously registering them. So let's break down some of these subtle touches. The violet-tinged gray wall to the left of the doorway has white wainscoting on it that continues onto the open door, but this wainscoting is somehow absent on the other side of the doorway. There is a brown baseboard that extends across the right wall but it suddenly becomes taller after it hits a table leg. The floorboards of this room don't line up with the boards in the next room. They don't even point in the same direction. And at each threshold, there's horizontal trim on the floor that acts as an additional visual burial barrier, making our visual passage through this space even more awkward. Now, usually artists will use floorboards or tiled floors as a tool to insert linear perspective into their picture, which builds the illusion of a consistent, believable space. And that's what makes von Hoogstraten's space so believably constructed, so convincing, is his carefully calculated use of mathematical linear perspective, 
with all of the lines, these are called orthogonals, um, meeting at the same vanishing point. They all come to this single point. Here in Hammershoi's painting, the wooden planks in the floor lead away from us. So there's this sort of attempt or this appearance of a linear perspective. But if we extend these lines outward until they intersect, they don't meet at a common vanishing point at all. They're all over the place. In fact, Hammershoi never seems to use true linear perspective, not just in this painting, but in his work in general. He just eyes his straight lines and estimates where they should be. And for the most part, it's convincing, at least to our conscious mind, to our surface brain. In this painting, nothing is perfectly straight. A 90 degree angle is nowhere to be found. The floor seems to be sagging, imploding, falling in on itself. The door frames are unstable and slope down to the right. And in fact, all the doorways slope at a similar angle, which makes this tilting, drifting feeling even more pronounced through the repetition. To the left, there is a full length curtain covering an unseen window, and it flares out slightly at the bottom, which also visually forces the door frame to slightly tilt away to the right, like the curtain is sort of pushing it away almost. The wainscoting on the bottom half of this first door, the one closest to us, gives it an irregular bottom heavy silhouette. And the curtained window that covers the room in a dull muffled light uh, causes shadows to form in the deep corners, but it seems unable to do more than just cast a feeble glow on the floor and facing door. The floor, meanwhile, wants to rise up and flatten itself against the picture plane, and it's only held down by that perpendicular weight of the walls pressing down upon it. It slopes down to the viewer, accelerated by the projection of the open door towards us, a kind of rushing off of the canvas and into our space. Now to emphasize these points, here I've traced the lines in the painting with pink. So these are the lines that Hammershoi painted, um, and I've simply gone over them to bring them out. And if you overlay straight lines in blue, you can see that there's a big difference here. And if we drop away the painting entirely and just look at the lines, this is even more evident. This is a strange structure indeed, a melting, sagging, irregular conglomeration. But notice how we had to really look at all the particulars in order to identify this irregularity. I mean, I had to go through and actually draw comparative lines in here to point this out. Now, our minds are automatically programmed to look for straight lines in order to orient us in space. You find this phenomenon if you're trying to hang a picture and get it straight. You'll look at the edge of the wall or the corner of the wall to try and use that as a guide. But if we are confronted by lines that seem perpendicular but actually are not, our minds get a little confused. It's not quite enough to completely throw us off, and if the inconsistencies were really obvious, then our minds would just recognize it as unreliable, and they'd reject that visual anchor. It'd be like, well, this is clearly unreliable, and move on. But by making everything just a little bit off, a little bit strange, our minds are keep futilely trying to rationalize and make sense out of this space, keep trying to approach it and make sense of it and turn it around somehow that makes sense, but they can't. The rooms are almost empty, but not quite. And what's interesting is that by presenting just a few objects to suggest the domestic setting, Hammershoi makes the emptiness even more profound than if there were no objects at all. It's There's enough to make us realize that there should be more, enough to point out the emptiness. A wooden chair sits empty by the open door in the second room, partially cut off from view by the nearest doorway. Closer to us, in the shadows behind the first door, is a small, plain table with an empty bowl sitting on top. And above, interrupting the vertical of the molding, a small black framed mirror whose glass is similarly empty, reflecting nothing but shapeless gray. It's interesting that each of these objects are meant to contain something, but they're all empty. Empty chair, empty bowl, empty mirror, empty rooms, empty home. In the distance at the end of the corridor created by the open rooms is another large, vaguely formed piece of furniture. It's dark mass resting under the corner of a framed picture, of which we only have a partial cropped view. 
again, it's an almost, we can almost see the whole piece of furniture, but we can't. We can almost reach the chair, but we can't. We can almost make sense of this room, but we can't. Now, you might reasonably be wondering at this point uh, whether the Hamishoy's apartments were actually this sparsely furnished. Well, contemporaries did remark on the simplicity of their home's decor in comparison to the reigning, fussy Victorian aesthetic. The sort of popular decorating uh, style at the time was just to accumulate a lot of stuff. But this is almost certain, is almost certain that Hammershoi intentionally eliminated objects from this painting in order to achieve the desired pictorial effect. He's not simply reproducing what he sees. Here's another painting set in the same room, but with our view turned slightly more to the right. A bare table fills the, the uh, mostly paired bare table, excuse me, fills the foreground and it subsequently pushes us backwards out of the space. Ida is sitting at the table with a teacup and teapot and looking down at something in her hands, probably knitting or needlework. And in the corner behind her is a tall cylindrical wood stove whose metal pipe travels up the wall parallel to the strip of decorative molding. Now this stove is a non-portable object, right? It can't be moved around the way a chair or a vase or even a table can, but it's absent from four rooms, which was painted a year earlier. Now, it's entirely possible that the stove had not been installed at that time, although you can't just install stoves anywhere. You have to have vents for them. But we know that Hammershoi was prone to omit, omit elements from his paintings as needed. We have an example of this in this painting from 1900, which is set in Hammershoi's childhood home rather than an, in his and Ida's apartments. And incidentally, the um, Strandgade um, or Fredericksberg Allee um, that are in the titles of these paintings are the location. So this home was on Fredericksberg Allee. In this painting, uh, we have Ida or maybe uh, Hammershoi's sister Anna uh, standing in what appears to be a dining room with her back towards us as light filters through the facing windows. And this is a very similar to, um, has many of the characteristics of Hammershoi's work in general. We have this gently filtered light, uh, this quiet domestic interior, the light reflecting off of the wood floor, this female figure who seems to be unaware or uh, actively ignoring our presence. And we also happen to have this photograph that was found amongst Hammershoi's things. We find the same setting as the painting, taken from the same angle, but it doesn't have the woman in it. And in fact, otherwise, Hammershoi seems to have drawn his entire composition from this photograph, which he perhaps took specifically to serve as a reference for his painting. He wanted to paint this room and his childhood home, but he didn't want to be always going back and forth, so he took a photograph to take with him. In the photograph, you'll notice that a large lamp is suspended over the uh, table, but it's totally absent from the painted scene, which is otherwise very meticulously reproduced. And so this confirms that Hamashoi was not simply reproducing reality like a kind of human camera. He was actively editing things out and making changes in order to achieve the desired result. There's a really peculiar quality to Hammershoi's spaces, as if they were viewed through a dim filter of memory or sleep. They have a kind of velvety texture. Light and shadow and line and form are all carefully rendered, but there's this sense of diffusion, like the edges of things aren't quite solid or fixed. And this is the result of Hammershoi's working technique. So usually painters will lay down the lighter tones first and then do the darker tones. But Hammershoi did the opposite. He finished the darker tones first and then worked the lightest zones most heavily. So you can see that in this detail um, from the painting of the interior courtyard of the apartment building. Because the lighter zones were painted last, uh, dark edges peek out from under light tones that aren't sufficiently opaque to totally block out the darker colors underneath. So rather than forming crisp silhouettes, we, as would be achieved by placing the darker colors over the finished light areas. There's this sort of fraying effect. 
Amershoy also often painted thinly enough that bare canvas is visible. You can see that um, at the edge of the window frame here. Uh, this raw buff color is just incorporated into the tonal harmony of the composition. Now, another feature of his painting technique is that Hamishoi worked using short dabbing brush strokes over the entire canvas. And instead of varying the brush strokes according to the texture or shape of the depicted object. So you can see that here, especially in the highlights that are under the um, window. Uh, and then in the top edge of the recessed uh, coffer in the door, uh, excuse me, under the window in the wall. So this method creates a uniform diffused surface, but it also makes it more difficult for the eye to distinguish between forms because everything has the same texture. It's a technique that Hamashoy developed while still uh, as an art student at the academy, and he actually um, it becomes more pronounced as he continues his career rather than less. Now, like most of his painting, um, paintings, Four Rooms is built upon a spectrum of grays, ranging from a dark white on the door to the nearly black of the mirror frame to the soft violet tinted French gray of the walls. It's a veritable symphony of gray, and it's easy to see the logic of contemporary comparisons to Whistler, who conceived of paintings as tonal arrangements like Nocturne in black and gold and Harmony in white and pink. It's actually surprising how many subtle shades of gray are tucked into this painting. I told you earlier that we'd come back to the mirror. Hanging behind the door and set against a dappled gray-brown, the mirror seems almost small and inadequate for the large empty wall on which it hangs. It's like a, a too small hat on a too large head. The mirror should project outward slightly because it's attached over this raised vertical molding, uh, but it seems to be flush with the wall. We don't have a distinguishable shadow. Its reflection reveals nothing to us simply a square of unarticulated gray-brown space with a slightly darker strip to the right. It could be anything while resembling nothing. So visually then, the mirror is nothing more than another set of lines in Hammershoi's arrangement, echoing the rectangular forms of the open doorways, the angles of the molding, and the corners of the room itself. In terms of information or narrative construction, however, the mirror plays an interesting role in the painting. Throughout Western art history, artists have used mirrors as tools to give the viewer more information. Here is a classic example. It's the Arnolfini portrait by the famous 16th century Dutch master, Jan van Eyck. It's well known for having a lot of symbols in it that have to do with love and marriage and fidelity and the like. But for our purposes, what's interesting is the convex mirror on the back wall. It shows us two new figures who we can't otherwise see, uh, perhaps meant to be us and the artist, Van Eyck. So here the mirror is used to complete the pictorial space and as a way of bringing us into the story and into the image. It's also a way of the artist uh, showing off his skill, his ability to render so meticulously these small details. Now, incidentally, the reason this looks like a fisheye camera lens uh, is because this is, as I said, a convex uh, mirror, so it's um, half spherical, hemispherical, uh, rather, uh, as opposed to a plane mirror, which is flat, and what we're used to today. Now, in Hammershoi's Four Rooms, by contrast, the mirror's reflection is completely unhelpful. Instead of showing us the space outside the confines of the canvas, the space that would be behind and to the right of us, the reflection just shows an undistinguished blankness. So rather than acting as a window of revelation onto an otherwise unknown space, the mirror is a wall, barring access to our broader surroundings, refusing us information that could anchor us in this place. By knowing what is behind us, so to speak, we would feel ourselves more solidly incorporated into the scene, being bounded in front and in back by visual forms. But by denying the viewer this orientational tool, Hammershoi keeps us floating on the edge of the pictorial space, amplifying the sense of ambiguity that is already present in the inconsistent spatial construction of the scene. The open doors invite us forward, but the mirror denies our presence. 
permitting us a view through the four rooms, Hamashai invites us to move farther back into the space. But our passage is made difficult at every turn by the floorboards that totally ignore the rules of mathematical perspective, by the horizontal thresholds that act like bars, and by the way the floor flips up towards the picture plane. There's a persistent tension here between invitation, access, and belonging versus rejection, denial, and othering, a back and forth of forcing to keep our distance while dangling the possibility of access. Hamashoi constructs a feeling of longing within the viewer by holding back what we cannot have. A longing for what? For home. Hamashoi renders domestic space strange. The rooms intimately familiar to him become, in his paintings, distancing denials of real presence. This is the mirror in which I comb my hair, yet it refuses to reflect for me. This is the chair in which I sit, yet it is kept out of reach on the other side of the door. Hamrishoy makes the home seem unhomely, but subtly, in a way that slowly creeps up on you, working its way into the back of your mind like the diffuse but pervasive sunlight. It has to be subtle and slight, or else the viewer would just say, aha, this is not my home, and that would be the end of it. So instead, the viewer says, I belong here, yet this space does not belong to me. But this subtle alienation doesn't occur just in this painting. This ambiguity, this just real enough depiction of the rooms is paired with contradictory spatial cues uh, that engage the viewer in his other domestic scenes as well to a greater or lesser degree. Within the structure of these domestic walls, the heavy space folds in upon itself. It's as if in a distant memory, we see perfectly what lies before us, yet it's dim, faded, warped, and strange somehow. The home has become unhomely. There's no clear sign of dust or decay no broken window panes or or uh, doors that are knocked off their hinges. Nothing, no sign of neglect that would indicate that this home has been abandoned and thus justify this strange hollowness that seems everywhere. Nor is it full of objects and furniture that would make up for the lack of occupants through its coziness or just distract through the hyper illusionistic clutter, like kind of I spy game. Instead, it's empty. It is, by the very structure of the word, uncanny. Now, you've almost certainly experienced the uncanny, even if you've never heard the word before. It's the feeling that something is not quite right, but is not so far away from normal that it's obviously wrong. It's creepy, but not because it's foreign to us. It's creepy because it's somehow familiar. For example, in today's world, there are robots that look, speak, and seem to even think like humans, but they aren't human at all. The uncomfortable feeling that you might get from these creations, the sense that they're somehow just wrong, that's the uncanny. Ghosts are another example of the uncanny, although not this one because these were too adorable. But with ghosts, we're seeing something that should be dead, but it seems to be present in the world of the living. It's not right. The uncanny occurs when something just barely crosses over that boundary between normal and abnormal. The uncanny is a feeling, a phenomenon, a state of being. So it's been around as long as human beings have existed, but it was first identified and given its name by a German psychologist named Ernst Jensch at the turn of the previous century. In German, uh, the word is unheimlich, uh, literally meaning unhomely. Heim here means home, but in the sense of a site of really deep-rooted emotional attachment. It's not just the place you live or dwell. It's the place that you belong, where your heart lives. Uh, it's a place of safety, of comfort, of warmth. The Danish word heim is identical in meaning, in meaning, excuse me, and comes from the same etymological root. And like the German pairing of heimlich unheimlich, heimlich and unheimlich mean cozy and creepy, familiar and foreign, homely and unhomely. So in four rooms, Hammershaw creates an image and inspires an experience with the, within the viewer of the uncanny as the familiar, cozy, and homely is emptied of its warmth 
and instead rendered unnerving, strange, and unhomely. This painting, Moonlight Strandgata 30, was painted in the same apartment, but at least 30, excuse me, not 30, eight years earlier than four rooms. We have here an entirely different layout, uh, whereas we previously had a view into deep space through the open doors, here we're faced by a wall, a large window, and a door, all sitting perpendicular to our gaze, almost like they're confronting us in a way with their own architectural silence. Another interesting characteristic of Hammershoi's work is that he often returned to the same place in his apartments from essentially the same um, possession, excuse me, perspective or position, uh, but played with the motifs by adding and subtracting different elements to you know, see the different effects and get the uh, result he wanted. So this room we see here is the apartment just stripped down to its barest elements. You can't take much more away. But Hamashoi also tried adding a human presence to this composition, as you can see here in this version, which may have been painted before or uh, in tandem with the moonlight scene we were just looking at. Now, instead of being enticed through a series of doors, we're faced with a closed door, a window that looks onto an interior courtyard, and a woman who is turned towards us but who makes no movement or approach or wel to welcome us. Her hands are even clasped behind her back, and the table sits firmly between us and her, separating us. The form of her face and head has been shaped with the appropriate contours and hollows, but there's only the very barest hint of lips, eyes, and brows. These features instead sink into the hazy texture that characterizes the whole scene. And if the eyes are the windows of the soul, and the window beside her looks out only onto an interior courtyard and the door is closed, what, if anything, are we to make of this? The unsettling edge of uncanny mystery that we found in four rooms is absent here. I don't think it's due simply to the woman's presence. I think it has to do with the construction of space. Now, there may be a window and door here, but they do not invite us anywhere. In fact, in spite of these two openings, we are essentially faced with a wall. We have nowhere to turn. There is no possibility here, no hint of something or someplace else, no, no um, something else beyond beckoning to us that we can't quite reach. Instead, a sense of stillness reigns over the setting. Now, the place that most intrigues me in this painting is the right edge of the pool of light on the floor where it's been partly blocked by something that we can't see. It's also featured in the moonlight version, but it isn't as noticeable there. Um, it's not as um, sharp or as large, really. In the sunlight version, it's more distinct, more pronounced, and I think it's more interesting here as well. Why? Well, presumably this is some piece of architecture outside the eaves of the roof or a chimney or something on the courtyard, but it's the only hint of motion in this otherwise heavy, silent stillness, a sign of the sun's movement across the sky, causing shadows and light to shift. And there's something in this light, or rather this absence of light, that makes it seem like we are frozen in time here. We are trapped inside, almost, as other forces work around us outside. We cannot get out, but this light filters in. Time passes. Shadows grow long and the light grows dim, but still in this silent room, this closed door, this window to nowhere, this denial of human contact. If four rooms was the longing for home and existential homesickness, then Strand got a sunshine is the longing for a past that is no more. The persistence of emotion and memory experienced in our minds in a frozen present tense, a kind of haunting of our psyches by beautiful phantoms. This at least is my interpretation of these paintings, and it's certainly not the only interpretation. In fact, it seems to me that part of Hammershoi's appeal is the ability of his paintings to offer an invitation to the viewer to be confronted by something that is at once familiar and unknown, something so close to us that we don't always see it clearly, but which when Hamishoy presents it to us, we can almost remember meeting once somewhere on the edge of a thought. <laughs>